I was not looking forward to the doctor appointment, so my mood from the start was not the best. It was a referral visit to an office I had not yet visited. I'd been asked to arrive 20 minutes early to fill out some required forms. With other things to do that day, I was happy to arrive early. I quickly dispatched with the necessary paperwork before being asked to take a seat in the waiting room. I chuckle now when I remember wondering, as I found my seat, if my early arrival might even get me seen early. <laughs> it was a busy office shared by several doctors, at least some of whom were apparently OBGYNs, because lots of pregnant women were there waiting with me. I enjoyed seeing them in their various states of life incubation, thinking back to the days of expectation and mystery when Susan was pregnant. I also marveled at how many of them had toddlers at their sides. Imagining how much these families would soon be juggling brought me compassion for them and gratitude that our youngest is almost four now and the days of diapers are behind us. The TV in the waiting room was on, reminding us all that caucus season is here, with ad after ad proclaiming either how bleak things are or how prepared a candidate is to make them less bleak. Do these ads really make a difference to anyone, I wondered. I used my smartphone to pose my question on Facebook. Responses trickled in, most of which claimed these ads make no difference along with a few comments that implied that I was too stupid to know that they were making a difference. I resisted the instinct to respond, oh yeah, well you're stupid too. <laughs> a small victory of restraint. <laughs> Every few minutes the door to the promised land of all that happens behind the receptionist would open. Another name would be announced, another person or family would disappear. As the first few names were called, I was relieved they weren't mine. I didn't really want to be there anyway. Besides, I had Scrabble turns to play and jewels to blitz. <laughs> Don't disturb me yet, please. I'm busy. Then time kept passing and my pregnant companions one by one kept being called out of the room with very few people arriving to take their places. I noted a sign on the receptionist window that suggested if I had been waiting more than 15 minutes, I should tell the receptionist. That's a nice idea, I thought. It had been more than 15 minutes beyond my appointment time. Perhaps something was awry. The least I could do was tell them. I wasn't complaining, I was helping. So I sheepishly approached the desk. Hi, yeah, well, <laughs> the sign says I'm supposed to tell someone if I've been waiting more than 15 minutes, so I'm letting you know that I have. The receptionist seemed surprised, a bit confused. After a few com computer clicks, she told me, yes, we are a bit behind, it shouldn't be too much longer. Okay, I said, I'm not in a big hurry, just letting you know. I wanted to assure her that I was cool. Thank you. <laughs> that I wasn't one of those kinds of patients who were impatient before they had a right to be. I returned to the waiting room. I scrolled some more through Facebook. As the clock ticked to 30 minutes past my appointment time and several more patients were called, I could feel a little self-righteousness creeping in. A little, you know, I came 20 minutes early. A little, don't they know that my time is precious? A little, this is ridiculous. <laughs> 10 more minutes passed, the room further emptied out. I'd already been waiting 40 minutes past my appointment time, a full hour since I had arrived. Now the situation had moved beyond mere inconvenience and into something more sinister. My inherent worth and dignity were at stake. <laughs> and then a magic 
moment of realization arrived. It was as if an angel had landed on my shoulder, the fluttering of her wings offering a refreshing breeze (laughs) as she whispered, the longer you have to wait, Mark, the more self-righteous you can be. (laughs) Okay, so maybe it wasn't an angel. A slight smile slid across my face as the possibility of newfound power arrived. It's not power that would be worth much to anyone, so I'm not sure we should call it power, but in that moment, it felt like power all the same. The way to regain my inherent worth and dignity that had been stolen, stolen, I tell you, by this incompetent doctor's office, would be to revel in my victimhood, to savor my delicious brew of indignation, (sighs) as though it were a sweet nectar of justice. So again, I took to the town square of Facebook. But as I pondered the well-worded complaint I would send out to the masses, I caught the irony that I was feeling energized. I caught myself enjoying my victimhood a bit too much. And so the post I offered ended up being a little more self-deprecating than it might have been had I not resisted the headlong tumble into the next moment, had I not found some humor in my reactivity I admitted to my Facebook friends that I was wanting the wait to grow longer so that I could feel even more self-righteous. Now, my post could still be classified as whining, but at least I was acknowledging how my need to put myself above others was leading me to yearn for more of the very delay I had been bemoaning. Shortly after posting, I had to put away my phone, for I was summoned at last. Still, the feeling of self-righteousness that I had claimed for myself was there, and I noted that the nurse who greeted me did not offer me an apology for the delay. See, I thought, she didn't care. I asked her if I could use a restroom. I was tempted to say I had been waiting for an hour, which is why I had to use the restroom. But I didn't. After waiting for me, ha ha, I thought, we walked together to the examining room where, once we sat down, she did apologize. I chose not to respond. That's right. I didn't do the Midwestern thing of saying, that's okay, even when I didn't feel that it was. My behavior was justified by our theme this month. I was living out what it means to be a people of resistance. (laughs) She said they'd been having computer troubles. I refrained from asking, I wonder why the receptionist didn't tell me that, and took her at her word. I'm not a monster, after all. (laughs) At least not this time. And the truth is, I felt ashamed that I hadn't responded to her apology, which I think confirms my Midwestern cred. I said, computer trouble, ugh, that sounds like fun. So much for my resistance. She continued in a weary voice as she typed, We can't really do much when the system is down. Everything we need is here. She looked tired. I could see that she was frustrated too, that her morning hadn't been going as she had planned either, that she probably hadn't been playing cards and drinking rum and Cokes in a secret lounge. (laughs) While I had been tortured by being forced to sit in a warm waiting room with television and free Wi-Fi. Tortured, I tell you. 
Later that morning, after I returned from my appointment, I looked at my Facebook post about the wait and saw that it had inspired some laughs from those who admitted they could relate. I saw some explanations and requests for compassion from those in the healthcare profession who know why delays happen and how unpleasant they are for everyone. And I even saw some consternation at how classist my complaint was. How in a world where there are real problems, my whining about having to wait was troubling, if not offensive. <laughs> Guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. The thing is that my time in the doctor's office, once I had let my self-righteous guard down enough to see the humanity of the staff, had already taught me the lessons my friends were offering me in their responses. I would have been better off in that office, as one of my favorite readings in our hymnal suggests, to resist the headlong tumble into the next moment until I could claim for myself awareness and gratitude, taking the time to look into others' faces and see their communion, the reflection of my own eyes. I got there to this communion eventually, but not exactly in time, not exactly when with a clearer mind I would have preferred, not before I'd behaved in ways that were not helpful to me or to others and that lacked the very imagination that I'd rather access in moments like this, the imagination that would help me see beneath the surface of whatever is happening to the world that is always there too. The world beyond my easy answers and self-focused narratives. The imagination that could lead me to better relate to the humans who are sharing and shaping every moment with me. The humans who are just trying to navigate their days too, amidst the ambiguities of life and the ever-present threat of their own headlong tumbles. I'm not denying that there are times when we or other members of our human family are victims of true disregard or disrespect, times when we do face circumstances that demand a response that isn't just accepting the status quo or too quickly offering forgiveness without expectations of changes or reparations, simply because those contributing to the injustice are human, just like us. I'm not saying that. But I am saying, or at least suggesting, that I've never regretted resisting the temptation to too quickly demonize others or to whip myself into a self-righteous frenzy, which feels helpful and powerful, especially during a campaign season, right? But rarely is. I am saying that any lasting changes that will make a difference toward the creation of the world we dream about, a world of more justice, more love, more compassion, will come from attempts at a higher purpose than aggression, passive or otherwise, <laughs> toward those who seem to be keeping us from what we think we want or need. Again, what is needed most, it seems to me, is imagination. It is learning to see the world beyond ourselves, to understand that our vision is always restricted by the limitations of our own perspectives and experiences, Therefore, we are called by the promise of a more loving and just world to seek to see beyond what we alone can see, to, as Miles Davis said, play above what we know. For that's where great art and music happen. I love that quote. And while I'm not a jazz musician, I think I can imagine from a musician's standpoint what he means. Davis was encouraging his fellow players to resist being satisfied with the easy notes, the familiar patterns, and to reach for melodies beyond themselves, the music that can only emerge when they play off the notes that others are actually playing. In that doctor's office, the easy notes for me were to remain self-focused, to think of the delays as an affront against me. But there were other notes available to me there, notes that I chose not to play, confident as I was in my initial choice to hear only the melody of my own victimhood, my own disappointment. On this day before we honor the life and ministry of Martin Luther King, 
I'm thinking King would appreciate the encouragement to play above what we know. At the heart of his work and his Christian faith and his approach to social change was his commitment to the uncommon path of nonviolence as a spiritual and political strategy, a way of being in the world based in love and seeking to extend compassion toward all. King did not always hold these ideals. In fact, thinking back to the early days of his involvement in the struggle for civil rights, King said that he believed an armed revolt may be the only way to solve the problem of segregation. But through reading Gandhi's understandings of redeeming the opposition through love, of basing every action in compassion so as not to provoke bitterness in those on the other side of a given issue, the more he could see the parallels between Gandhi's nonviolent methods and those taught by Jesus. After traveling to India to have conversations with and learn from people who knew Gandhi and who best understood his methods, King came to believe and to model that love coupled with nonviolent action was the most potent antidote to hate and the most effective way to bring about social and collective transformation. King taught in words and deeds that nonviolence impacts all involved in significant ways. He said it first does something to the hearts and souls of those committed to it. It gives them new self-respect. It calls up resources of strength and courage that they did not know they had. Or we could say it asks them to play above what they know. Meanwhile, those on the receiving end of nonviolence are more likely to have their conscience engaged and moral defenses exposed, thereby nudging them out of their certainties into a place where they are no longer sure what to do, to a place, we might say, where they will have to play above what they know too. Playing above what we know is at the heart of one of King's favorite passages, the well-known prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, the words of which the choir sang for us a few moments ago. This prayer was among the most cherished by Gandhi, too. The prayer reads, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. I hear in the words of this prayer and the life and legacy of Dr. King, and even in the details of that oh-so-simple story from the doctor's <laughs> office, the call to give ourselves to playing above what we know, to choosing to employ imagination beyond that which we can see, beyond which we alone can feel. I hear the call to approaching our lives as artists, who praise at length what still deserves to be praised, and who thereby do homage to the wretched and magnificent life that is ours. I hear the call to ministry, the call that can resonate with every one of us if we are willing to play above what we know. The call to ministry captured so well by my colleague Elia Clemmer in this meditation that I think were we to follow its wisdom and live its blessing would help us resist the headlong tumble into the next moment every time. She writes, Blessed are those who minister. Blessed are those who welcome the quirky, the lost, the unwanted, the ones whose sweetness usually goes unseen. Blessed are those who treat the fearful with gentleness and can see the face of the child in the one who is unkind. Blessed are those who do not use sarcasm as a weapon when their feelings are hurt and who tell hard truths with the intent to heal, not to wound. 
Blessed are those who hold in their keeping whole books of stories that can never be told, stories of betrayal and shame and sorrow, stories of how life shatters into pieces like glass. Blessed are those who offer comfort and hope in the face of the wreckage, who show up as soon as the news goes out, who meet the police on the doorstep, who hold out their hands. Blessed are those who sit with the upwelling of grief and the aching emptiness, who do not flinch back from pain, especially when it is raw and angry and new. Blessed are those who dare to find words to speak of such fleet, shimmering things as hope and grace and who know to speak of faith quietly and mostly in poems. Blessed are those who hold such stillness in their spirits that it radiates outward for others to rest in. Blessed are those who minister. It isn't always easy to minister, is it? Just as it can be a challenge to play above what we know. But the alternatives are not nearly as powerful, nor as filled with possibility. So who are you being called this season to console, to understand, to love? Where are you being called to play above what you know? How might you choose nonviolence and blessing and ministry in ways that will take you above the place where you've been playing all along, to the new place where you find yourself right now, to the next place you're going, and even above that. May you be emboldened and empowered by your answers for great art and music and justice and compassion and forgiveness and possibility await as does the world we most yearn to discover. A world that is livelier and lovelier than we can comprehend and waiting, always waiting to be seen. Waiting, always waiting to be seen.